Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to today's panel presented by the NGMA Mumbai, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, in association with the Guild Art Gallery and Avid Learning. This program is a continuation of Avid's collaboration with the NGMA, and I'd like to thank Dr. Anita Rupavataram and her team for giving us this opportunity again. Tonight's discussion is centered around a retrospective exhibition, The Earth's Heart Torn Out, Naujot Altaf, A Life in Art, celebrating veteran artist Naujot Altaf's decades-long artistic journey and practice, curated by Nancy Adajanya. If you haven't seen the show yet, please do so. Uh, I think it's open till the 24th. It's, it's definitely worth seeing. It's truly spectacular. So do come back tomorrow or later on in the week. Our panel tonight comprising of environmentally conscious practitioners who will examine the concept of eco-art and sustainable architecture within the context of the devastating impact of human activity on our planet's natural resources and issues of environmental decline and degradation. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our panel of experts, leading contemporary artists, Naujot Altaf, <laughs> architect Dean De Cruz, visual artist Ratna Gupta, visual artist and illustrator Sajid Vajid Sheikh, and our moderator for the evening, editor at Art India, Abhay Sardesai. Tonight, they will reevaluate the role of art practices and architectural models and materials in the context of environmental catastrophes of today and discuss how many forward thinking creative industry practitioners are addressing environmental crises in imaginative and responsible ways. For more about our distinguished panelists, please refer to the bio handouts that have been given to you. Uh, please remember, take out your phones, everybody, put them on silent and start using them. Start posting, reposting. Our handle is at Avid Learning, and our hashtag is Learning Never Stops. Over to you, Abhay. Thank you very much, and look forward to an interesting discussion. A very good evening to all of you, and thank you very much, Asad, for inviting me to participate. It's always been a great pleasure to be uh, part of your programs, also a privilege. Um, to set the ball rolling, you know, I uh, want to invoke the great Amitav Ghosh, uh, who in his uh, last wonderful nonfiction book called The Great Derangement, which came about two, three years back, 2016, asks a very pertinent question. He says, why is climate change not addressed by creative practitioners? especially in novels. And he surmises that it's probably a kind of a symptom of the age. Um, a swirl of occasions and events that are constructed as being real and pressing and relevant, while the elephant in the room, which is the real issue, the, cli the issue of climate change, goes unheeded. It's a situation that seems very familiar to all of us in this day and age as we uh, sort of you know, stand eyeball to eyeball with the uh, elections uh, coming in the next few months. Um, we realize as a corollary that art that looks at issues of environmental damage inadvertently has to examine scapes of social disintegration the false binary that exists often as a convenient shorthand between the internal and the external is upended as aspects of our li lives that were considered to be distinct are revealed to be interconnected and often complementary. And I'm reminded here of, of Susan Sontag who talks about this very insightfully in this uh, marvelous majestic work called Regarding the Pain of Others, where she says that art makes us alert to the fact that the deprivations, depredations of those who, you know, we, we generally slot as the have-nots, are connected to our own privileges. They are part of the same context. They share the same day, the same weather, as it were. So, she urges us 
to stop the pretense. So the first maneuver I would like to make today, therefore, is to contest the very term <laughs> eco-art. Like most labels, it is incomplete and does not do any favors to making the definition more inclusive. From the August assembly that you'll soon find uh, sitting here on the panel this evening, it is obvious that though there might be some uh, you know, concerns that overlap, there are not too many similarities in their practices. While eco-art might subsume practices like land art, landscape, genre painting, landscape photography, huge earthworks, what I find common amongst artists assembled here is a desire to question the role of authority, the desire to interrogate agencies of capitalism, the necessity they feel about reinstalling natural processes in the center of their works, the importance they give to arriving at strategies that will enable contextual, local transformations. Their work is also very sensitive about this issue of materiality, its politics, its status, its functions, and its impact, individually and collectively as a community. Collaboration, as, as we will know, as they unravel, unspool, uh, and talk at length about their own work, collaboration is the key word, and sensitization, critical sensitization, and consciousness enhancement is a drive that these art practices possess. Um, let me draw on the work of some of our contemporary artists to open out the diversity of approaches to the idea of ecology and its continuous and systematic destruction. I'm not going to talk about Navjot because uh, she's the Utsav Murti here. Uh, we've all come here, arrived here only after uh, partaking of the spoils of her wonderful show. Uh, so, and very soon I'll be inviting her here to talk about her works as well. So I'm going to actually talk about four other artists. And I'm doing this only to underscore the fact that any approach to you know, exploring the idea of ecology and eco-art uh, has different entrances and different exits. There are different, completely disparate <coughs> approaches to understanding this, 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 this quest for justice. Uh, the first artist I want to talk about uh, is Arun Kumar Edji, who re-employs material like crates, pallets, salvaged wood to sculpt towering composite figures. Now these figures raise very interesting questions. Are these demonic presences or are these gods of destruction? These are, there are sculptures of animals. An elephant, for instance, which is sawed off in half, revealing its innards. In Vulnerable Guardians, Arun Kumar foregrounds farmers and the flora and installs them at the center of this very unstable transforming world. Security personnel who manage our homes and buildings, who are mainly migrants, are also some of these guardians. I remember a show by Subha Ghosh quite a few years back, which also dealt with these figures um, as installations. Now, in a totally different key, you have somebody like Srinivas Prasad. You know, Srinivas Prasad's performances have often tried to explore the relationship that human beings have with their homes, their many pasts, and their localities. And he does this often through the agency of rituals that reassemble notions of private and public space. Now, one very interesting uh, installation performance that he actually came up with was called Known to Unknown and it was performed over a period of six months in 2006. It involved collecting the ash of an unclaimed cadaver after the dead body had been cremated. Srinivasa daubed and smeared the studio walls with this powder, painstakingly working over long stretches of time as a way of framing a homage to the departed person. 
In What Do You Do to a Dead Object? in 2007, he ritually buried an old car, covering it with dry leaves, metal mesh, and bamboo. You went down a flight of steps to enter the work. It was a kind of a metaphorical descent into the unknown. Atul Bhalla, the third artist, has through his installations and performances looked to create a map of water bodies that have been degraded due to industrial effluence and human disregard. His Yamuna LB project had him performing actions on the banks of these two rivers. Acts of immersion, drowning, enacting and ablution are occasions for him to look at contamination of several kinds. Pollution of actual water bodies, but also the toxification of social and political values, especially because of communal agendas of political parties. Ravi Agarwal's NGO, Toxic Link, has assiduously investigated ecological disasters. Many of his works probe what I would call <coughs> desperate landscapes. Abandoned mannequins, dilapidated building walls, oil spills, tar machines, dying vultures, among a host of issues. His flux in 2010-11 was his deepest inquiry, to quote him, into his relationship with the city. He interrogated the will to transform dwelling spaces into real estate hubs and the gradual disenchantment with real issues of ecology, not only as constituted by the natural world, mind you, but also by the social web of relationships that are curdled by caste and communal considerations. For a totally different reason, Charles Coria and his cautionary notes coded in the new landscape come to mind. To sum up, I do feel, however, as do I'm sure all the panelists here, that there is always the danger of an intervention degenerating over time, often emptying out of contestatory substance and confrontational enthusiasms, and becoming over time a series of feel-good flourishes that are initiated to acquire recognition for political correctness and so social engagement. And this is something that I think we should keep at the back of our minds whenever we're discussing politically uh, inflected art. So ecology of thought, of feeling, of inner, outer worlds. May I now invite Navjot to talk about the questions she asks and how she asks them. Thank you. Each of the panelists will get around 10 uh, minutes and we'll move on from one panelist to another. And at the end of it, we'll all assemble here, have a chat. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who's come here for this uh, session. And uh, then Evit, NGMA, and uh, Guild, who, has, who have made it possible. So before I show visuals of some of my projects, I would like to begin with how I, how I understand the creative processes of art which deal with ecological issues. I'm not going to call it eco-art because um, I don't think I consider myself as an eco-artist as such, but um, as I uh, share my thoughts with you, you'll know my position. So, um, so I understand the creative processes of art which deal with ecological issues through my work experiences, research, through readings, and interaction with artists um, uh, sorry, just a second, I just have to wear my glasses, sorry. Huh. Through my work experiences, research through readings and interaction with artists, activists, people from another field, um, um, and concerns um, in and outside India. It is a process which, I mean, the ecological art, which is a process uh, which recognizes the historic dichotomy between man and nature and works towards building and healing the human relationship uh, to the natural world and its ecosystems. It recognizes the importance, importance of interdisciplinarity and community participation to develop a flexible working approach and to be open to work with different kinds of people, life forces and materials, etc. In my video, Soul Breath Wind, on the ground floor, Manish Kunjam, an Adivasi spokesperson 
and activist from Dantewara area in Bastar in Chhattisgarh, speaks of Adivasi perception of the cyclical processes, their association and relationship to the land, water, and forest. Feminist awareness is also based on women's experiential knowledge, advocating that all life is connected, that our existence is always embedded in the cyclical processes of nature, etc. So I feel that such an art-making process requires artists to learn from lived experiences, from multiple disciplines, and from rigorous fieldwork, studying historical materials, and gathering data to understand the forces at play. But at the same time, gaining information or data is not enough. What one has to realize is that there is a cultural landscape where human activities affect everything that there's a nature-culture relationship we have been overlooking over centuries. Another point I would like to talk about is a relationship to the place which needs to be worked out. For example, if I'm not from Bastar or I'm not from Delhi or Hamburg or wherever I locate myself to understand the culture of the place and forces at play, I have to build relationships with people who are natives who have been there for a period of time, or those who have migrated to the place to work or settle down. It, it requires a long-term engagement to engage with all parties to formulate visions and constantly work and rework on them. So in my case, I work with NGOs and groups of people not registered as NGOs, and the community people I meet in the process who adopt processes of democratic engagements to advance social and ecological justice by engaging into long-term initiatives with a deep commitment to local communities and ecology. Whereas, as Gutari, in his essay, Three Ecologies, points out that the political parties and the governments are only pointing at the ecological crisis from a technocratic perspective. So through these contacts and interactions and what I read, I get to, or I, I got to um, experience, for example, uh, Gregory Betson, a philosopher and anthropologist, I admire greatly his concept of aesthetics of sustainability. Aesthetics of sustainability inquires into the meanings and implications of justice in a pluralistic way and it, con it conveys humility towards the non-human environment and interspecies relationships. So as one can see, such a process includes working in collaboration and combined interdisciplinary <coughs> research, community, research, community participation, and public interaction to develop a flexible working approach if artists genuinely, genuinely desires social change or transformation. To sum up, I will say that since artist is not an isolated uh, system, artist entrusted and engaged with ecology considers art as interdisciplinary links in relationships, not only between human beings, but also with other living, living species with, and their environments. And the balance between these relationships that is placed in a space occupied by both human and rest of the species. In short, ecological art processes rethink our social desire for, so, for sustainable cultures and environments. It refers to the concept of deep ecology. Also, the process of my, projector, my projects, whether Nalpar, Pillaguri, Soul, Breath, Wind, Barakamba, or Empty Containers, or Delhi Loves Me, have helped me develop self-reflexivity and a vision free of pre-assumption and preconditioning. Critical thinking, thinking as an investigator with aesthetic sensibility, attempting to identify conflicting and conflicted belief systems, and to develop critical engagement with questions of political efficacy. So I feel that the artist can create a passion for perception, value, and visions 
for desired change, or as Helen Mayer and Newton Harrison, two very um, uh, great artists in involved with eco art, say, artist as a storyteller of alter tales. So now I'm going to show you some of my, one more point that I want to make that given uh, artists work with the community, it becomes collaboration with the community people. Artists should be able to transcend authorship and ownership in the community rather than claiming a sole authorship of the creative inputs. Our Nalpar and Pilaguri projects in Bastar deal with such concerns. So I will be showing you uh, images of some of my projects. And uh, so most of the projects actually entail the basic principles of uh, interactive, uh, cooperative, and collaborative um, you know, modes of art making, basically to initiate a dialogue to begin with. So um, this is an image which uh, the first one was the work process of my work with the artists from uh, Adivasi area in uh, Chhattisgarh and the community people. And uh, this is Bala Khamba, 2008, which uh, actually started with my examining of uh, the uh, complex relationship between the um, uh, development schemes and the people, you know, who live there and uh, the, and, uh, and then the process sort of led me to, um, meet many, I mean, actually, I, I mean, meet many people from, um, uh, you know, uh, working areas like, uh, you know, auto rickshaws, uh, auto rickshaw wallas and uh, um, water seller or, um, um, you know, environmentalists or um, all kinds of people, economists in JNU, and which actually helped me to understand the which actually helped me to understand the, you know, uh, gradual loss of green, um, you know, spaces in uh, Delhi city, and also the, you know, removal of hundreds and thousands of trees in uh, Delhi, overlooking the role of uh, a tree in uh, a road zone, you know, and so which this particular work actually resulted in three uh, videos and. Uh, and two of them are in, in one an expert is speaking and in another a person, you know, a, a person from the experience and another from uh, the analytical point of view. And the third one was where people could, you know, which was a direct camera and people could speak about or their reaction to or the response to the work or whether this was art at all. And this led to this, in the second phase of Barakamba, which I call Barakamba 10, 2010, was a collaboration between um, uh, an environmentalist and uh, biodiversity scientist, which, um, you know, uh, talking about the, um, the trees, you know, which were totally choked on Barakamba Road. And this was then uh, moved to uh, very, uh, I would say, effectively, uh, to de-choking of 180 trees, and it was also in collaboration with the um, uh, NDMC, uh, New Delhi Municipal Corporations, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, department, and uh, and we were able to remove. I mean, we were able to de-choke about 180 trees. And some of the, you know, the, the drawings that you see here or the image la right down here, this was the image we had submitted, three of us, that is the scientists, me and the, the environmentalists, with the help of uh, the workers who told us that this is how the trees will uh, survive. And then every year from 2010 to 2014, but I have an image here uh, only till 2012, then, you know, the state of the trees is like this from there to here. Then this is also a project which is uh, which looks at uh, the you know uh, LB River bed, which has been uh, <coughs> so which uh, um, which was deepened from 1857 for um, I mean seven times, 
And when I was working there, it was they were going to deepen it further for the ever-growing um, need to deepen it for the bigger ships to come there. Uh, and uh, so there was a resistance against that, but I heard that they had deepened it again. So this was a project called uh, Empty Containers, and it was, um, you know, uh, uh, in the form of 4,000 uh, books, you know, which look like containers, and um, uh, where people could sort of take them away or read or add uh, their relationship or understanding of such. Um, you know, problems that they were facing even at day-to-day -day level because uh, the water um, condition of the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the river was deteriorating. And uh, so this was also an interactive project and it, I did it in uh, collaboration with many people from Germany and in India. Um, and then there is this, this is a project I did in Bombay as part of uh, one of the projects called uh, Geographies of Consumption, where I'm looking at uh, four river basins that we have in Bombay City, and how the, the rivers are, uh, you know, abused and appropriated. And we all know that how, you know, the Bandra Kurla complex has come on uh, Mithi River bed and about 1,000 uh, acres of land is used for that. And, um, and then I, for that project, I thought that to uh, understand that, I saw the flow of river and flow of uh, the blood in the body um, as uh, similar to that. And I worked with cardiologists and I worked with uh, scientists who, uh, you know, um, uh, are uh, dealing with the, you know, and who are uh, sort of, um, mm, uh, looking at the, um, the, the condition of uh, the, the water from these um, rivers. And these rivers are no, no longer rivers, they, are, they become like nalas. And this is my last project that I'm talking about, Soul Breath Wind, which you will see also downstairs. So I'm going to show you only one project. So for example, this image, this, this uh, village, th this place was about four villages and one dam. And in the film, people talk about how when they, they had uh, four villages and a dam, for throughout the years they were able to do farming and they were happier than what they are now. And because there's coal underneath, it has been taken by the uh, mining company. And um, uh, uh, so this is, uh, you know, again, my, uh, you know, being to those places with permissions and uh, from collectors and from local authorities and all. Thank you. Thank you, Navjo. The sort of um, art premised on <coughs> constructing a critique of exploitation anchored in history, class relationships, art born out of a long-term engagement, art positing solutions, art as a solution. Let's see what an architect has to say to this, Dean De Cruz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'd like to share with you my a snippet of my journey and uh, learning, for learning never stops. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so basically, we, as a young architect uh, uh, practicing, practicing in Goa, uh, we actually started with low-cost homes. And uh, when looking back at our work, and people say, oh, it's a, it looks sustainable and looks sort of green. And these are taglines that have come fairly recently, and we never really thought of those things. We're just being <laughs> sensible about the way we approached architecture and uh, being low-cost. And I really feel those are the two real criteria of sustainability. So the early project was just recycling old materials, building materials, and using labor. India has an enormous amount of craftsmanship and labor that we can actually tap and use instead of using <coughs> industrially produced materials. So over the years, we've actually trained about 200 masons and craftspeople in the building in, uh, industry, uh, teaching them traditional ways of construction, so arches, vaults, domes, using the minimum amount of uh, uh, concrete and steel. But Sustainability is also about uh, community. It's about creating community. So in other projects, like housing projects, we actually, how do we actually create a more humane environment and create individuality in the environment? So we're working on a housing complex. We, we realize that we have to have an individual identity to each apartment. So it's, it has, each one's got separate different staircase, courtyards, uh, detailing that happens in it. So they feel that they have their individuals in a larger community, which 
we need to bring together. Our work spans, of course, housing, hotels, and everywhere we've, we've actually tried to push the boundary in what are the materials we can use and how can we actually create or introduce a good level of craftsmanship in our buildings. Uh, so we, again, using recalling traditional systems of you know, situ floors and you know, brick domes, um, again, as minimum use of uh, cement as possible, and incorporating craft and, and detailing in it. Uh, we also have some projects which are extremely embarrassing to us. Uh, um, <coughs> this is Vijay Malia's house. Uh, <coughs> uh, his brief to me was, uh, I want to be people to feel weak at the knees when they come to my house. Uh, <coughs> and hence the two lines. Uh, I'm not sure if they feel weak at the knees or weak in the stomach eventually, but, uh, but that's the sort of thing that, that the problem with, with architecture today is it is a slap on architecture. We slap on these imageries and art has been divorced from it. Traditionally architecture uh, and art were actually completely connected. If you look at the buildings in, in south of Bombay, it, they, there were no two disciplines. It was one discipline held together uh, with creativity. That's of course the end. So just places for you know, art to be slapped on. And really that the learning from this is really that uh, these are the models that people follow. So what do we actually get these sort of people, the rich, the famous, the Amitabh Bachans, the Ambani <coughs> types, to actually start living in micro homes? There's, and homes which are sustainable. There's a story of this American millionaire who had this enormous 14-bedroom mansion. And, and you throw parties in it, and eventually he's, you, know, you just felt completely empty. So he bought this little caravan and parked it on his lawn. And people started really enjoying it because it was out of the typical way of you know, these lavish uh, uh, do's and into the very simple uh, living style. And, and they, a lot of other people said, you know, we need to reduce our material sort of uh, consumption and then look at ways which are actually connected to the environment. So a little after Malia's house, we actually got this uh, house, which is about one two hundred the cost of Malia's. And, uh, it's this family who said that we have this very, very limited budget, actually 11 lakhs, and um, uh, can you build it to us? And it was quite a challenge because when we started off as low-cost architects, and we really had lost the ability to, to get down to low-cost again. Uh, so this really taught us how to do that. And the people actually got involved in it. The <coughs> husband bought the materials, the wife actually detailed it, the sons got involved in making things and sh you know, for the house. Uh, and that showed us this participative nature that we actually have. Uh, as you know, we look at traditional education today, especially in architecture, and we're taught to actually become these specialists. But we have to give back. Traditionally, people used to build their houses, you know, and we've taken that skill away. We need to be able to get, give that skill back to the people. Uh, <clears throat> our work, you know, while in Goa, actually doesn't really look very good because we feel we need to be climatically responsive. We need, so instead of creating buildings which are more enclosed, tighter, well, to go in architecture may be pretty. It's, it's not really climatically responsive. So we really create pavilions, and we create buildings which are far more transparent and let in a good amount of light and ventilation, especially humid climate, you need air to move through it, good amount of light moving through it. And our buildings are these giant roofs, umbrellas, with a vast amount of transparency uh, moving through it. Uh, this is a cathedral we've done. Uh, again, all, the idea is to break the convention. It's, it's, it's got an eccentric entrance and a floating roof, so the, the walls actually don't hold the roof together. It's just these tree-like columns that actually support the roofing system, and uh, local granite, of course, from the area. Uh, we work a lot in uh, eco-sensitive areas, and coastal areas, and jungle areas, and we've slowly use, got to develop li lightweight materials which are, uh, which fit in with the environment. Uh, here it's uh, these cabins in, in the coastal area, which are just uh, pavilions, very light pavilions. Each has got a different theme, winter, summer, autumn, fall. And we got artists that get involved, fabric makers, even a poet to write a haiku for different seasons. Uh, uh, <coughs> and we realized that actually this trip of actually going in an architecture that's temporary, that's ephemeral, where you know, it's just, it just lasts for six months. Uh. So this is a pavilion we did for the Taj. Uh, it's a restaurant which cost us nine lakhs, uh, and it earns 50,000 rupees a night. Uh. So they've covered the cost of the building in, in, in a couple of weeks. Uh. And we said that's the way to go because you can actually renew it every year if you want to and, and make it fresh again. And very simple materials. Uh. Uh, while working in the jungle, we realized we have to respond to the traditional people who've been there. So the, the tribals who've been there, what are the materials they use? So this is in Bandipur, 
there was a great amount of st stone masonry, craftsmanship, thatch masonry. So we actually got them to make uh, uh, the buildings with using their traditional materials here. Yeah. In uh, Bandavgar for the Taj, uh, not buildings. We Again, the local people built it. The women actually did all the decoration work. And we used the craft of the area. So while it has the comforts of a, a regular hotel, we've, we're adapting to what we can get locally. Um, we've worked on a, on a museum, an art gallery, which is called Moog, uh, Museum of Goa. It's Moog in uh, Konkani means love. Uh, and this is, of course, a traditional museum which has things in it. We've tried to spill out a little. The difference we've done in this building, which let's see inside of it, is actually create the factory in, uh, in it. So the, fact the production actually moves uh, from the back of the building right into the forward area um, as a factor. But we realize that art actually needs to move out. So when the Seven Deputy Festival people are said they, we want to display the, uh, the craft uh, pavilion. So basically it's a competition to have a craft school pavilion. So we created a building which actually takes art and architecture to the people. So there were models of uh, all, <coughs> all the entries that were there, drawings, and more so there were actually, there was potential, you had forms that you can fill in, what do you like about the building, what, how would you do it yourself, or whatever. So it needs, it needs to go to the people, both not only art, but architecture as well, because it's then only can we actually improve the quality of here, but if we have general public awareness of, of these areas. And of course, you need to also prove to yourself. So that's our office where, so we talk about sustainability, we said we have to show it in some way. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Um, from architecture as spectacle to ar architecture as a network of local and climactically responsive material zones. Um, may I now call upon Ratna Gupta to come and uh, read out a manifesto, maybe, an anti-manifesto, perhaps, performance about being a non-eco artist? I do not consider myself an eco artist. I can't tick all the boxes, but I do believe that all artists today should instill some of the principles of an eco artist, if not all. Somehow, environmental crisis is tied into my practice without me having to focus on it as a subject. It's my surroundings. It's the world I live in. It's in every breath that I take. I am perpetually trying to explain myself as an artist, my practice. I never used to think that there was a need to. I still don't. It confuses me totally, the need to interpret for the viewer. The work speaks what it chooses to. The viewer reads what they choose to. They are my stories. At times, I've thought myself a conceptual artist. I've dreamt of being a surrealist. Sometimes I wish I was an abstractionist. That way I wouldn't have to worry about content or how my content is interpreted. It's my attempt at a little humor. Recently, I've come to feel that maybe I'm on the side of existentialists, the recreation of experiences. I am probably completely wrong. I'm not taking every part of existentialism as being part of my practice. Yes, I do believe we have choice. Even to not choose is a choice. I understand the debate on no free will. I also agree with it. Contradiction in my practice. But I also do believe in responsibility for one's choices, whatever they may be, in whichever situation one was made to choose. We do have to attempt to exist in that kind of world responsibility. And then there is angst, personal and beyond, fear, <coughs> breathlessness, a sense of resignation followed by rage. And then I make. It overcomes me, rarely, sometimes, always. I've come to accept that that is the beginning of my work. The act of making is my outlet. I don't know how to exist without it. I attempt to talk about life, emotions, mine, and maybe because they are mine, they do apply to others. We are all human beings. To be humane is a practice that we have forgotten, but that is a conversation for another time. I am quite obsessed with material. The material I use, the act of doing, the act of making, pouring, peeling, applying, coating, stitching, cutting, tearing, imprinting, casting, mixing, bonding, 
repetition. It keeps me grounded. Claustrophobia. It used to play a major part in my practice. Wrap myself in plastic, take a mold, cast in fiberglass. Claustrophobia as a fear of small spaces. <coughs> Claustrophobia as an inability to breathe. Claustrophobia as being surrounded by too much. Overconsumption, the desire for more. Want, I want, we want. Nothing is needed, everything is needed. It's all about wanting and needing. It can suffocate. I used fiberglass and polyester resin to cast. Material can talk. Chemicals can be beautiful and detrimental. Using chemicals to talk about the organic. Nature is wrapped in plastic. It's the world we live in. There is a series I did called the Memory Series. The trees I grew up around were disappearing. I imprinted what I call the memories of trees. Tapestries, in a way. Can you call latex natural? It is, part of it, but it has ammonia added to it. Everything is double-edged. Everything is not a sword. For the past decade, me and my surroundings have been together in a knot that doesn't seem to let go. Considering angst overtakes me at the best of times, the state of my surroundings has caused me extreme levels of distress and fear. The world we live in, what will become of it? What are we leaving behind? What have we done? What will we do? Soon no one will be able to take a deep breath of air. All this mingles with my day-to-day -day existence, the angst of the moments of each day, personal, emotional, dramatic. When you stand on a beach and you see a small piece of plastic, you hopefully pick it up and put it in your trash bin. That is if there is one around. If you are me, you put it in your bag. My bag sometimes is very heavy. The relationship between finding and making is very intricate. That has become my practice. I don't know how to be an activist. I don't know how to mobilize people. I make work. Each has something picked up from my path, thrown by someone, construction material, so much construction, plastic that has entered my space because it wrapped and protected something in transport. There is fallen wood. It carries the memories of our surroundings. If I am happy, they are joined. If I am sad, things are cut. My studio is full of other people's little thrown away things and fallen wood. Is it an impact? It is personal, but it's one piece at a time, myself and the world I live in. To use the natural in one's work can make one feel that they are using magical tools to tell a story. Each element, be it wood, a seed, a feather, stone, each carries many layers and memories of its surrounding. A thousand words said without saying anything. I have used chemicals extensively. I have, for the sake of my art, used materials that are quite dirty, even metal castings, foundries. Nothing is free. In my own small individual way, I have let out toxins. I have <coughs> harmed myself and the area around me for the sake of my art. I will not deny that I am not free of all that. I am not an eco-artist. Broadly speaking, an eco-artist uses activism. It is also to create art that informs people of environmental issues, to creatively propose new ways of sustainability. I do not do any of the above. I do not know how to. My work is very personal. As I mentioned earlier, repetition keeps me grounded. I am interested in making visible, suppressed, or repressed meanings, hidden or unacknowledged aspects of what can be discovered by looking hard at what already exists in the world, or what I put in front of you as small little objects and appendages. They contain the story of me in the present. Today, I consciously use materials that change, even resin or latex. They change, time, impermanence natural elements, the wood, the dried up leaf, ephemeral material, so important in today's world, change, 
has to be accepted. Loss has to be accepted. Memory, time, dust. When I mentioned responsibility, one of the aspects is artistic practice. Over the years, I have changed a lot of my material, attempting to walk the talk. Water-based varnishes, epoxy instead of polyurethane and polyester resin, it's not such a big achievement. I don't throw the waste that art can produce. It stays within my studio. It gets used somewhere or gets collected into bags that stay. Trust me, come and visit. That will become a future story someday. I try and minimize it, but it's a small, tiny effort. Old work becomes new work. Nothing gets thrown away. Every piece of hardened waste resin is collected, every used container kept. Someday. It's about being aware of the impact we make while making art. Use local material, reduce carbon footprint. Someday. All of us tell different stories. But in our way, we talk about the world we live in. This is the world we live in. As artists, we are supposed to tell, tell the story of the time we live in. We are in a state of degradation, personal, the world, our environment. I can only state that in my practice. I do state that in my practice. I never meant to state it. It's so much a given for me that I didn't even notice it until others pointed it out. I don't know. I have no solutions. I don't think we can change it. We can stop. But the world would have to change, one person at a time. How will we live if all that we are used to gets taken away? How does one look at progress? What does that mean in today's world? Countries send their trash to other countries. Today, those countries are saying no. There is no more place on the earth to hide our trash anymore. We are even eating the fish that eat our trash. We are finding more and more ways to poison ourselves. The sea has no borders. It goes round and round and round. There is no ecological balance. Animals live in that balance. They support ecology. We act like guests in a big fancy hotel. Recycling can only do so much. That itself is over consumption, over energy consumption, gas emissions, Estrogenic chemicals are released from plastic. They mimic estrogen, high levels of estrogen. Nothing is free. No one will take responsibility. The one who makes and the one who consumes. Reuse or use less. Stop. It won't stop. We don't know how to. Angst. Perpetual. In my practice, I will never be able to speak about environmental, social, or political issues outright. I don't know how to. It has to be about me. And in all that emotional angst, it's all there. It's all hidden. It has to be found. Because as an artist, if I talk about myself, I'm talking about us all. We need to start being aware and take responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratna, sort of poetry that sort of framed the, the risk of being vulnerable. We have to change, as Ratna said. The world has to change one person at a time. Can I now ask Sajid, to, uh, Sajid Wajid Sheikh, to please come and tell us how he intends to change the world? I am Sajid Wajid and uh, I am a visual artist and uh, I uh, do a lot of different things altogether. So basically trying to basically understand, I explain to you guys like what I do as a practice and uh, also trying to make sense of what I do uh, in art is, uh, is, is one word, it is basically a huge uh, uh, learning in, in my own self and uh, trying to understand what I do is is trying to basically just join two things and like you know try to go forward with it and uh, trying to do that what I do is uh, I uh, live on day to day basis with, with, with art uh, and not put myself onto a, a, a thing where I try and put myself like hey I am doing this and try and label myself 
So moving forward, uh, I'll try and explain like what I do as my art practice every day. So I am a visual artist and I'm also a commercial artist. I uh, make w images for, for a living and uh, I make uh, doodles for Google. And uh, these are the two Googles, uh, Google doodles that these people have given me to like, you know, uh, uh, pay homage to uh, Epic Indians. And moving forward, I paint uh, murals and uh, I paint, uh, I've recently painted a, a, a basketball court. Uh, this is this was a collaboration between uh, in uh, the India uh, India and uh, Canada, which was basically uh, a joint venture for uh, um, for Air Canada, and uh, they wanted to like you know give back to the community what like you know uh, in terms of art. So this is something that I built for them. I also paint murals on the buildings. So this was something that I, I sort of you know do. So basically, like, you know, all these images would explain to you, like, you know, I don't really consider myself, like, an, uh, as a muralist or, like, say, I don't consider myself as a person who uh, does a, a particular thing. So I just, like, you know, go with the flow as, 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 as it comes to me. Moving forward, um, I had, like, uh, I mean, I just wanted to tell you about this really weird story of uh, how I stumbled upon uh, doing uh, sustainable art is uh, basically I had like a, a, a show in a, a local cafe and um, uh, unfortunately the, the turnout wasn't so great. So also what I do is like for like killing time is sketch. So I, I like you know overthought and I thought like you know a lot of people are going to come in and I have to be talking to a lot of people. So what happened was I didn't get my sketchbook. So I didn't have my sketchbook and nobody turned up. So I was like, okay, cool, now what do I do? Like, I have to kill time, so somehow. And I stay in Washi, so I have to like, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. So I started walking around the city, uh, around the, the space that I had, like, my show in, uh, which was in Kamla Mills. So, uh, uh, Lakshmi Mills, actually. So uh, I started gathering, like, stuff around from, from, like, the local neighborhood, and I started putting them together, like, you know, so I mean, I, I normally look forward to like, you know, having something as a dialogue on my Instagram. And I was like, okay, cool, let me just put something on Instagram by saying like, you know, if I can make these, like collect these junk and like, you know, make like face portraits out of them, I can just like have like a, like a story around. That's where it started from. And um, that just triggered like a, like a different direction in, in art. And uh, the inquiry that I sort of, you know, wanted to like, you know, like dwell into also as a as a unique uh, form of art. So I started like you know collecting different things around uh, my studio. Like so, for example, like you know, uh, like if you can see, like you know, bunch of things are just like a remote control, like some random clips and stuff around. So um, having been doing that, like I started having like you know really fun by collecting different things and putting them all together. And uh, moving forward, I started making more and more and more of these kind of like, you know, uh, uh, these kind of things. By doing that, like, you know, it like, like, uh, uh, when you when you're talking about like, you know, learning never stops, like it, it gave me something back to learn and look back upon. So I was learning like, you know, things about what this thing means to me. So I read about this thing called pareidolia, which means like, you know, if certain things put together looks like a face. So it's basically not a face actually, but it's like bunch of things put together, but looks like a face. So it's just a, it's, it's just a, a, a psychological phenomena. So moving forward, like I started like again, like, you know, collect, started collecting more and more of these stuff. And uh, having doing that, having been do, like trying to do this kind of stuff and this kind of art, uh, I was approached by uh, a street art festival uh, last year where to do like an installation there and uh, they basically just asked me to do whatever I really wanted to do and really wanted to like you know explore. So I thought okay like I'll, I'll collect bunch of things and uh, I'll put it on, on the wall and uh, in doing so I really f I didn't realize like I don't have enough material to work with. So I realized, okay, like if I'm trying to do something with like uh, found found object, I might as well try and look at somewhere while I'll, where I'll probably find a ton of it. So at at one point in time, I realized the only place that I can really find this kind of space is is 
uh, a dump yard. So I, I actually uh, live uh, in Navi Mumbai and a dump yard is like say one kilometer away from where I stay. So I was like, okay, cool. Let me just check, like you know, if I can get these these material from that point, and uh, see if I can, like you know, and also like I didn't have like a lot of money to like you know make an epic installation around. So I was like, okay, cool, like like I can use these kind of stuff and maybe make something around it. So the objective was basically to just find some object, and uh, while doing that, I realized like when I went there, like I sort of saw so much junk which was thrown away by us which sort of you know really like put me to shame in terms of like you know how fashion and anything else that like you know we follow just makes us like you know put things in garbage and try for new different things like you know in this in, in that sense like say for example like you know that the, the nose on that the center character is a dhara can uh, oil, oil can you know probably my mom must have thrown it away just because like you know she wanted a new dhara can bottle uh, whatever you know and looking forward like you know i sort of felt like so terrible about how we feel like if we throw things away they are gone and if if it's not in our house it's not there in our conscious but if you have to really go and check out like places like these you'll understand they are not going anywhere they're still like in in the same vicinity as you are it's just basically like you know if i th take this remote control and put it in behind my back i probably think like it's not there but it's still there so having to having said that i really wanted to create something like that just changed my direction like i mean in the entire sense like you know i didn't really wanted to do this like like i didn't go in with that approach hey i'll create like a change in environment and stuff but it sort of you know gave me that idea of like hey like this is what it is and this is what you deal with and that dealing is what i wanted to show in my sculpture there and uh, this is what i did like i collected a huge chunk of like all what i could get and i put it all together like faces and um, yeah these faces basically like look at you as zombies from the past and uh, that's what they are doing right now and they're looking back at you and um, yeah, I mean, in that entire sense, like, you know, while doing this, it sort of made, like, entire sense to me, like, you know, build this thing and, like, go forward. And uh, that's my time, guys. Thank you so much for, for your patience. For these extraordinary presentations, really, I mean, you know, uh, entertaining in the right sense of the term and very informative and incisive. Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that actually struck me when all of you were talking, uh, especially after you, Sajid, was this accent on uh, what one might call a recycle economy and how images and buildings can actually be uh, a product, you know, of processes which can be employed to inflect stuff that, is, that has been thrown away, right? So, uh, Drawing from that, I realized also that one of the abiding features of the work that, you know, uh, that, that the four of you have talked about is this obsession that you seem to have with the idea and experience of space, you know. So in, 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 uh, in Navjot, you find space as a fraught scramble for land, you know. Uh, and the transformation of land into real estate, something that can be monetized and sold. And uh, uh, in, in you, uh, Dean, we find uh, space as a zone where living, cooking, eating, thinking, working happens. And it happens in a certain manner where uh, it can either become spectacular or intimate. You know? uh, and in your case, um, Sajid, it is a, a, a way of creating a, a universe out of urban detritus, you know, and in some measure it is complementary to what Ratna also does. Uh, a lot of uh, natural stuff, throw away material, and uh, what one might call uh, art povera, uh, you know, stuff that, that people used to do in Italy in the 60s and 70s, uh, 50s. So I, I just wanted you to respond to uh, the provocation that the idea of space actually frames. Mm 
digressing a little, I think. Uh, um, <clears throat> as architects, we're, we're perceived to be people who are always dealing with space and building and everything. But as we um, build a lot, as we see our buildings being used, uh, we realize that our priority is, is different as the years pass. And, uh, there's a famous Australian architect uh, who mentioned recently, he says, uh, architecture doesn't interest me anymore, it's, it's people. And I think you, f you find this thread happening, Doshi recently uh, mentioned it as well. And I think that's, that's extremely important because who are we building for? Who are we actually creating these uh, products for? And uh, the frightening thing that's happening world round is, is really this term iconic buildings. And, you know, so everyone's trying to do this one statement that will you know, bring them fame and fortune at times. But it's, it's really disturbing because that's, that's what we have as a model. And, and I think we really need to look back and question it, what are we doing as architects and designers and in what we create? And are we really fulfilling the agenda? I mean, this whole thing of sustainability, which is now supposedly based on environmental concerns, has been hijacked by, by uh, technology providers, by material providers, saying that this is now green. And I think we need to really question that. What is sustainable? And how do we really address sustainability? And I think the core thing is really to reduce our footprint consumption tremendously. And we can do, only do that by example. And that's, that's extremely essential that we, we sort of uh, provide a template uh, as not just as architects, but I think as people who, who can influence people uh, in a particular direction. Uh, Um, <clears throat> um, you know, I have always been interested in uh, understanding my own association with space. And my interest has always been, uh, I think from very young age, to understand different associations with space. You know, so when I talk about um, in my work also that, you know, one area which were three villages and a dam, you know, what it meant for people and what it means to now when we see it under development, you know, because it, is, it has coal underneath and uh, it's extract, extracted and all this is because of that. So I'm more interested in that kind of, uh, you know, um, um, different associations and as you can see from my presentation also, that's why I work with people and um, um, my uh, interest is into, um, you know, look at it from very different perspectives, or say space like a riverbed, you know, which is like, uh, like I said, uh, Mithi River, you know, thousand acres of land, thousand acres of uh, Mithi River bed on which Bandra Kurla complex has come up. We don't talk about that, you know, we don't want to understand that, and we always sort of push aside, and very proudly we talk about the most expensive land you know, most expensive uh, property in, in, uh, in Bombay City, even more than, you know, the town area. So um, I would say that I, I'm interested in looking at space like that. Yeah. So um, having, having said that, like, you know, the thing is, uh, when you're talking about spaces, the thing is, the the city is is not going like you know grow, growing any any further than you know. The thing is like we like why why while we are moving forward, the city is just getting more cramped up. And uh, while like when when I was talking about like you know when I really got down to go to the the dump yard, I realized like you know uh, like you don't really walk into a dump yard, you really climb into a dump yard. So the thing is like like I realized the thing is. Uh, it it just keeps getting higher every year, like some centimeters up, like every year. And in like like five years, six years, you're like you know you have like this much amount of land, like that's just getting like up up high. So basically, having said that, the thing is, uh, like space is something that you know, like you really need to understand that you know, like now that you're sort of throwing everything away, it's not really grow going anywhere else. But I mean, so what you have in your hand is not just waste. But some sort of material that you can, you know, like you know, take that material, build it back, like refurbish it, maybe do something about it. Because, like, honestly, I saw like a a, a mountain of just helmets, you know, like of just helmets. 
like i was thinking like i ride a bike and i like would throw away my helmet and like not think about it twice and like when i saw it i was like dude like i just like i'm i'm just using another helmet because i wanted to where was this in pune no this is in turbe <laughs> i'm just being yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean uh, it's 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 uh, well, it's fascinating when you see this kind of spaces yeah, yeah. Right. No, no, absolutely what about you ratna um, i i'm claustrophobic i uh, <laughs> i mean that's the only way i can define it i live in bombay mm. uh, it's killing me slowly uh, and the space fascinates me in the sense that i like to play with it as an artist I mean, at the end of the day that's like i said i don't talk about these things in my work so if you give me an empty space even with just a single line i like to play with it but we're talking about cities and and things like that so i'll talk about claustrophobia in that sense yes. so when i am claustrophobic which in a flat or a mansion it doesn't really matter i go for a walk and i walk and i walk and i walk for hours but i'm walking around the area i grew up in which is bandra and when i grew up there you could actually walk you can't walk anymore it's um it's like an enclosure it's it, it's 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 like literally you have roads and you have the area is the same i recognize everything everything is the same it's just cramped in ways that i don't understand anymore there are the overwhelming amount of construction in i mean it's it's kind of it saddens me it frightens me 3 years ago i started feeling that i had something on my skin and in a bit i first thought i was premenopausal or something like that oh my god my body is changing it was cement i had layers of cement on my skin when i went for this walk that i needed to clear my head out because i felt claustrophobic so where am i to go then that i i live in bombay no sure I, I, even right. your the experience of your show at sakshi i remember was actually that of the entire room being one installation which was composed of all these distributed items and objects you know so uh, in in many in 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 way uh, subliminal ways and also very stated ways your ru- your your art installation was uh, was patently architectural yes <laughs> no we tore things holding tiny little actually i wanted to put more right um i was told not to that night's too much mm. no one can focus um but that was the sense i wanted to create of these these big metal beams and you know where everything is bigger than than you are i don't know <laughs> right It you know but this sort of uh, brings us to this very uh, important and uh, essentially contested very vex- vexatious kind of proposition which is a proposition of beauty you know i mean all of us are in some way sort of informed by the idea that beauty is at the center of a lot of art production um and you also realize that there is a way of of uh, responding to the world at large to the city which is so incredibly ugly and to the transformation social and political which are violent all around you how do you then actually set out as artists as architects as uh, urban inter- interventionists to preserve you know that that little space which you can actually uh, think uh, holds the core of what one might call beautiful or you know i i absolutely realize that beauty is a bourgeois context i mean uh, proposition but there is also something about it that one needs to uh, preserve you know So I'm just wondering about how would you like to would you care to uh, uh, think aloud about it? I think the I mean little efforts that we see of reclaiming public space at like the Kalagora event that takes place or a lot of other art festivals that take place uh, uh, in India where they actually we've lost public space in our cities and, and in fact India has India cities have some of the smallest open spaces compared to other cities in the world uh, and uh, it's not, we're going to lose more and more as we in the perel millland issue where we saw a vast amount of land actually being lost to developers taking over potential space that could be actually given back to the city recently the uh, the, the portrus land you can see Still going 
Eastern Waterfront, uh, which we've seen, is just going to be one exclusive elite place. In fact, in the drawings that they show, there's iconic building also mentioned over there <laughs> as one of the features. And uh, so, so I think it's art uh, can uh, needs to be political. So is this architecture to actually reclaim the space that is due to us. I mean, roads are getting broader, and the car, of course, is the biggest killer of the city. I mean, so luckily, of course, there's a metro coming up. Don't know when, but it will to some extent. But it's a little too little, too late, maybe you know, for the city. But I think if, if just as the awareness, it's just that you realize that you know it's closing in on us. Uh, um, I escaped. I was born and brought in Bombay, and I escaped to Goa 30 years ago. So, but we. So there are a lot of people actually moving out from big cities like Delhi, you know, and uh, coming into smaller towns and uh, for relief. But I think. We need to also stem it in our cities before they die completely. Oh, yeah. So, uh, carry this question forward to, uh, to uh, Navjot and both of you. Do you really feel that this schism between art and activism is a false dichotomy? Especially Navjot, you who've been like so assiduously and sedulously committed to so many interesting projects. Should, should all art, art be political? That's no, the. I don't see art and activism as two different. Yeah. Art, you know, I really don't see, because I feel for everything, you know, forget about art, in life, you know, anything to get, anything to do, anything you have to work, and what is that work? I always question myself. Even if I go to get vegetables, you know, I'm making an effort to go and get something. You know, if I'm uh, making work of art, I'm sitting for hours together in my own studio also. Sure. You know, so I don't see art and activism as two different, uh, you know, areas of uh, concerns, which people have divided it, actually. If we are responsible citizens of, you know, which we all want to be, and now more so with, with so much of deterioration of our environment around, each citizen is sort of asked to be responsible. So what is that responsibility? Isn't that a kind of activism where you have to actually act to do something? Whether it is a small kachra dabba in your house, you know, if you want to keep it properly outside so that the person who comes to collect, whom we call jamadar, does not have to, you know, smell it or he doesn't have to look at the, the filth that you have put in. So you have, can be responsible even about that. So for me, art and activism, on, yes, yes. Sure. No, I mean, I, I, I do agree. I state that I don't know how to do activism because I don't put it out there. I don't make these statements. Um, day-to-day level, I think I'm sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Day-to-day -day level, I mean, there is... <laughs> exactly. So that's what I'm saying is that I, I don't put it out there as a, as a fact that it kind of almost like... It's, it's, that's why I said one, one thing at a time. It's a repetition. I, if I talk about what I do in my own space at home or how you try and live and try and make sure that you do a sustainable living, that is ingrained into me. It's, um, it's I don't know how to live in any other way, which is why every piece of trash that I come by goes into my bag or it's in my house. Um, in, in that sense, art does. And it is side by side because, I mean, you could be painting. It's just that you have the political artist or the activist artist. and than the artist that likes to hide behind the work. <laughs> you know, in, in, in that sense, so I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, um, for, 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 for me, in that sense, what it, it varies from like it being political or like activist to like just being random. And uh, it, it just depends on what I like, you know, it triggers upon at one point in time. Like it can trigger upon like, uh, something spiritual to something completely like mundane. So I mean, I, I also understand like you know when you're making like a lot of people when they start uh, start uh, getting into art is basically when they start getting into like drawing or like you know this kind of like you know very uh, basic forms like you know a kid would draw would be like you know it, this guy would become an artist. You know, like so basically when you look at that like that person whoever is drawing or whatever is doing is also using a lot of paper as a material which is also like you know degrading the the environment that you sort of like you know you're, you're killing trees or making paper and it's always like that balance sort of you know you sort of how do you i mean i don't understand how how do i like you know balance it out like you know it's not always like 
I mean, I would create something and call it art, but it's not really impacting anything sometimes. So it is contradicting sure. in that sense. So, yeah. sort of contradiction. No, no, absolutely. The contradictions between art, activism, beauty, and uh, propositions of utility, functionality, yeah. and aesthetics. Yeah. It's impossible to create anything by destroying the natural beauty. You know, I mean, we are, so for example, even my work, this how perfect perfection can be, actually a comment on that. You know, now for example, the whole uh, Manhattan, you know, I was in New York and I, I mean, I can speak about Bombay also. You know, the, like I talked about, um, you know, um, Bandra Kurla complex, some of the most, um, you know, impressive buildings there, but what is it built on? So, you know, so these things also we need to, uh, as an artist, as a, um, as a person, as a citizen of this city, these questions come to my mind and which I find is quite natural. You know, it's not that you want to be political or you you are political. That's why you're doing it. I'm sure that uh, everybody sitting here would be um, thinking that uh, at day-to-day -day level, these questions do come to our mind. I, I saw a program on CNN recently about uh, uh, Japan, the Japan you know, sort of uh, aesthetics and ethos of the place and how it really actually moved into the world of art, architecture. And it's really interesting because you could see it reflected, at least in the architecture that I see over there. I can see that aesthetic drawn off a traditional uh, conduct of their cultural background in the architecture. And I don't know if we've really defined what an Indian uh, sort of cultural ethos is, uh, our own Indian aesthetic, because what we see as Architecture Day is, sad to say, a lot of rubbish here. I mean, around the place. And it's, there are very few examples of really good buildings uh, which really capture too much rubbish as the city continues to float on a moving bedrock of filth and sewage i think it's time for us to open it out uh, please feel free to yes uh, would you please introduce yourself as well hello everyone uh, my name is tanya vaidya i'm an artist i work with natural dyes uh, my question i've been following namjoot altaf's work he cruises work for some time and i work with communities and uh, rural these of the time and traditional communities. So my question is, uh, is our obsession for technical proficiency, is it, is it taking away the power from uh, communities? And your, you want me to ask yes, um, See, I'll give you one example. I think it will answer the question. Now, there's a village called Nagarnar in um, Bastar. Huh? And uh, so it's a um, weaver's village. Now, when I, when I look at weaving as a profession, I don't see that weaving in any sense, you know, um, destroys or damages the environment. So, um, and then in that village comes, um, you know, a mineral company, you know, a government company or mining company which sort of, you know, um, uh, for that uh, uh, kind of industry, they require land. So they require land not only for, uh, to build the, uh, uh, you know, structure of the company, but they also need to dump things. So slowly all the land gets sort of, you know, um, acquired by um, force or by whatever, you know, sometimes they give compensation. And sometimes compensation is not even given. So you can see that whole procedure itself is so, um, uh, you know, uh, not this. So, but I'm asking this question, why should something which is not damaging to the environment be stopped? And something which is so damaging to the environment under the pretext of development should come up there. You know, so. The problem with, at least with architecture today, is we want everything instant. So we don't have this ability to actually allow for craft to build up to it. And, and therefore, we're actually disconnecting craft completely from the environment. What's taking place in certain areas in the Southeast Asia is very interesting. It's a hybrid architecture that's taking place. So you're creating an architecture or framework for architecture that can come up very quickly, whether it's a concrete or steel frame. And then you have the actual infills of local materials, and local craftsmanship that actually infill the building, which you can change you know, over time, in the next five years, whatever. And that's an interesting model that's slowly taking place. And I think that that would be really great to even try out in India. Actually, this goes on with Navjot's answer. I mean, I continue with that. Because I was wondering if you were art practitioners, 
think of this idea of development at all. I mean, <coughs> development ka bhi ek had hota hai, I would say that, you know, we just speak in terms of GDP and, you know, we'll develop and we are an underdeveloped country, we'll go ahead, we'll make uh, glass-fronted buildings and not realizing how it is damaging our environment and so many other things, our, our mental health as well. So, in any specific way that anyone, any of you have thought of this idea of development, you know, what should development be? You know, and using that, like, I mean, we can, we, to be comfortable in, in our dwellings, for instance, uh, Mr. De Cruz, right, your name, you say you take the, um, the, the, the surrounding or the local craft and craftsmen and the materials as well in order to renew almost our, uh, not only just renew tradition and good practices of living, healthy, green practices, but it, it is also a, a, a development of a sort. I mean, it's going anti um, the modern idea of development. Even as we need technology and science, but you still, you still in a very, in a, I would say, going against the grain and doing uh, the kind of architecture that you do for people's homes. So the question of development itself, and now Jo does raise it in her, um, in her work everywhere, you know, she said the pretext of development, under the pretext of development. But we have to develop, but is this the way to go? I think, uh, you know, really to, uh, which might sound very uh, boring to people, but I think the reality is that we have to really go back, 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 ki w what is development and how did it start? You know, with the Industrial Revolution, you know, about 200, 300 years back, and in our country, say, about 100 years back, we can, even when you were talking about temperature or when we are talking about climate, see where we are. We are at 400 and... Um, you know, uh, I think 15, 20 ppm at the moment because of the CO level, you know, rising so high. So I think we need to ask these questions and, you know, when you talk to, let's say, people like Adivasi who have lived, who have lived experiences and they speak about certain things and then you speak to or you read, you know, scientists like who have written on climate change like... Um, you know, um, James Hansen, who's written this beautiful book called Storms of My Grandchildren. So something that an Adivasi is saying and a scientist who's dealing with climate change is saying the same thing. They, he's saying that uh, if at all, if there's no turning point any longer now, if we really think about environment and development. So we have to change the way of development, perhaps go back to take a U-turn. You know, U-turn is not there, but we have to now start thinking about perhaps, you know, certain ways of living like these natives, you know, or uh, Adivasis, perhaps was the best because we have to really, really pay attention to how till 300 years back, you know, environment had not deteriorated the way it is deteriorating. So I think, you know, instead of going round and round about many things and have so many words, we, we really, really have to think how we have to you know, um, uh, think of development. And development is something which has to be done with the local people, you know. The people, you know, development cannot be sort of, you know, or any policies cannot be um, decided sitting in Delhi, sitting in Raipur, or sitting in some far away place and then you go and impose. So I think we have to think about what development actually is. Like I was just giving an example just now. You know, for example, there are a kind of crops grown in these places which are very healthy. And now all of us healthy people who are conscious of health are buying those things and eating. You know, gluten-free, this, that. Whereas these people have been eating for ages. But the ration shops now supply cheaper wheat, so they have started eating that and they don't no longer grow these things. So I think development should be where somebody also tells them what is, they're already developed, you know, in certain ways. And they should consume those things instead of giving them something which is cheaper or uh, because thinking that they are poor, but actually in their thinking and in their living they are not poor. Maybe they're economically poor. So if they're economically poor, we must question why they are economically poor. 
why this man-made asymmetries, you know, allows one person to exploit another person to such an extent that other person becomes somebody without any existence or um, identity. And same way they are doing to the, in my opinion, to the nature. If I can briefly just talk about the development. I really think, as, as architects, we, we need to look at building communities and not buildings. Uh, if you look at Bombay, for example, and the reason why Bombay is still livable it is really it's an assemblage of villages. I mean, there's Bandra, there's Dovi Dalao, there's Mazagon, and there are distinct communities that you can almost identify. No doubt it's slowly getting more and more cosmopolitan, but because they had these individual identities and all, you know, sort of cohesive and, and still uh, able to live together, uh, it, the reason it survives uh, as a place, because you can see identities in different areas, but not just one even bland city. Um, and I think that's, that's extremely important that we actually build an assemblage of communities and keep that in mind whenever we're developing. Hi, uh, my name is Madhvi. I'm a product designer specializing in recycled materials. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, how do you build awareness of eco-art? <laughs> um, well, I did state I'm not an eco-artist. Um, it is not about awareness of eco-art. It is about awareness of, of the world we live in and, and um, how you take responsibility for the choices that you make. I mean, there, there, is, there are certain points, um, if you read what an eco-artist is supposed to be, they go into about six, seven points. There are artists that actually do all those. And no, I don't think they do. There are no. some. The six, seven points. No, I am, I'm, being gen I'm, I'm also generalizing in the sense that if you want to be that perfect, um, you know, you have to cut carbon footprints, you have to um, have solutions for sustainability, you, the, you know, you have to mobilize. There, there are many. In that, in that sense. I, don't uh, I know, that's what I'm saying, I don't. I said I was looking, that's, so that's why I, I specified. Mean, I don't think <laughs> so if I have to answer, so if I have to answer something like, like you know, how do you, uh, uh, it's basically like, like advertising, you know? Like uh, choose, the, just choose the most, um, uh, I mean, this is my opinion. So you can choose the most uh, uh, common uh, platform that is like prevalent in whatever space you are in, and try and force that 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 those kind of materials, those kind of stuff around. So right now, like say for example, like all these people are talking uh, are talking about like uh, unpolished uh, uh, dal, say for example. That's basically the answer, you know. Like when you create awareness about like you know in the in 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 the. Uh, in the media, in that sense, in in the in the space where pe you can actually go and uh, tell people about it, you can inform people about it. You know, like however possible, like through art. Uh, art is, is is a medium. You know, in that sense. So, like if you can create, like like say for example, if you can create uh, sculptures around using biodegradable uh, material and uh, celebrate it. You know. And that celebration itself can lead f for people to get inspired by that entire uh, understanding and like you know inspire them to use those materials in that sense. So it's just basically uh, trying and uh, uh, explaining and understanding, making them understand about it. Them in the sense like the general masses. So yeah. Thank you, uh, great panel, for this absorbing discussion. I just wish we had a little more time. We've only scratched the surface. Uh, thank you for being a great audience. We had over, uh, almost 200 people in this room. Thank you for coming. There's going to be an official vote of thanks, which I didn't know, which is going to happen now, and the lovely Krupa is going to do it. But at AVID, you have all our programs listed out. We have a couple of programs here next week uh, and the week after at this very venue. Uh, details are all available at the desk, or uh, you can just follow us on social media and keep track. Thank you, anyway. For coming and we look forward to seeing you next week actually on Tuesday out here. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Gill Art Gallery would like to thank Avid Learning for collaborating and putting together this very important panel on questions of eco art and sustainable architecture. We would also like to thank uh, Abhay Sardesai, the editor of Art India and uh, Naujot Ma'am, uh, Dean De Cruz, uh, Sajid Wajid and uh, Ratna for a stimulating presentation and discussion. Please do make time and uh, come and see Naujot Altaf retrospective, uh, which is a collab, uh, sorry. 
which is presented by the Guild Art Gallery and it is curated by uh, uh, Nancy Adajanya and uh, it is until the 25th of uh, January and uh, yeah so you you all can please join us on our next panel discussion which happens on the 17th of January uh, at the same place sa same venue at 6 p.m. and uh, the discussion was, uh, is on the uh, not yet revolution the ongoing debt uh, debate on art and activism at uh, NGMA and the panel is led by Geeta Kapoor, Ranjit Hoskote and uh, Vasanthi uh, Raman. Uh, thank you all for your support and joining us over here and I would also like to thank the NGMA team. Thank you so much. Good night.